Welcome to the First Unitarian Congregation of Ottawa. My name is Mary, and I am delighted to be your worship associate this morning. Normally, if you would like more information about First U, it would be available at the welcome table at the back of the pews. However, while the First U building is closed because of the COVID-19 virus, you may instead contact us through email at welcome at firstunitarianottawa.ca. I repeat, for more information, please email us at welcome at firstunitarianottawa.ca. This morning, I welcome you into my home and the homes of First U's music director, our director of religious exploration, and I believe the home of this morning's speaker, Leslie Kemp. Thank you for allowing us into your home. A few more announcements. While the building is closed, staff is working remotely. Phone calls are checked less regularly, so please email for a quicker response. Emails are monitored during usual working hours, Monday to Friday. Now that we do not see each other in person, please sign up for the EUU, which is our weekly email newsletter, or check our Facebook page or our web page for notices and updates. After the service, our no normal hospitality hour will be replaced by a virtual getting together. If you would like to join us for the hospitality hour on Zoom, please see our website, www.firstunitarianottawa.ca, or our weekly email newsletter, the EUU, for information on how to do so. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, Whomever you love and however you identify, today you are a part of our spiritual community. Welcome. We hope you come back soon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Deirdre Kellerman, and I am the music director here at First Unitarian Congregation of Ottawa. All of the music that you're hearing in the service today comes from one place. It's a collection of new protest songs for a modern age. It's a songbook called the Justice Choir Songbook. It's a collection of music written by a bunch of different composers, many of whom uh, are regular composers that the choir sings music from. And this music was written for protests in mind, pieces that were repetitive, pieces that it would be easy to write new lyrics to, music that you don't need instruments to, that you could sing on the streets and sing in groups. So the music today uh, fits very nicely with the theme. And while it may be new to you, uh, it's pretty repetitive. I hope that you sing along, join along, and if not, it, the words are very powerful, so I still hope that you appreciate the lyrics if you're just listening. If you're a person who likes to sing along with sheet music, or if you're interested in learning more about the Justice Choir songbook, you can look in the text underneath this video, and I have put a link to it for you. It is a free resource uh, with a donation option, so I encourage you to check it out. Enjoy. It doesn't have to be like this. It doesn't have to be like this. Today, it doesn't have to be like this. No, the it world doesn't have is to possible. be like this. Today, it doesn't have to be like this. No, the world is possible. Today, it 
I'd like to share these opening words from Reverend Lynn Harrison, First Unitarian Congregation of Toronto. Committed to respond to the call of a wounded world, we join together this day with loving hearts, hands, and minds, embracing the interconnected web of water, air, and earth. We light a fire of sustaining hope, ever bright with love and justice. May we bring forth this day new wisdom, strength, and courage to create a new world, not of wealth, but well-being, a world of new peace and abundance for all. As we give thanks for this earth, our shared and singular home, may we dedicate ourselves to its ongoing care, rising to the calls deep within us and all around us, May we respond today and always with courage and with love. It's Neo, your Director of Religious Exploration. Hope everyone is doing great on this Sunday. The story today I'm reading to you is about a flower. So I thought what better place to read a story about a flower than in your beautiful meditation garden. Uh, the name of the story is A Proud Rose. So I'll try to see if I can read the story while showing everybody um, some of the flowers that are in bloom here. All right, wish me luck. One beautiful spring day, a red rose bloomed in the forest. As the rose looked around, looked around, a pine tree nearby said, what a beautiful flower. I wish I was that lovely. Another tree said, dear pine, don't be sad. We cannot have everything. The rose turned and remarked, it seems that I'm the most beautiful flower of this forest. A sunflower raised its yellow head and asked, Why do you say that? In this forest, there are many beautiful flowers. You are just one of them. The red rose replied, I see everyone looking at me and admiring me. Then the rose looked at the cactus and said, Look, look at me. Then the rose looked at the cactus and said, Look at that ugly plant full of thorns. The pine tree said, Red Rose, what kind of talk is this? Who can say what who can say what beauty is? You have thorns too. The proud res, red rose looked angrily at the pine and said, I thought you had good taste. You don't know what beauty is at all. You cannot compare my thorns to that of a cactus. What a proud flower, thought the tree. The rose tried to move its roots away from the cactus, but it could not move. As the days passed, the red rose would look at the cactus and say insulting things like, this plant is useless. How sorry I'm to be its neighbor. The cactus never got upset and even tried to advise the rose, saying, God did not create any form of life without a purpose. Soon spring passed and the weather became very warm. Life became difficult in the forest as there was no rain. The red rose began to wilt. One day, the rose saw a sparrow stick their beaks into the cactus and then fly away refreshed. This was puzzling and the red rose asked the pine tree what the bird was doing. The pine tree explained that the birds were getting water 
that the birds were getting water from the cactus. Does it not hurt when they make holes? asked the red rose. Yes, but the cactus does not like to see the birds suffer, replied the pine. The rose opened its eyes in wonder and exclaimed, the cactus has water? Yes, you can also drink, drink from it. The sparrow can bring water to you if you ask the cactus for help. The red rose felt too ashamed to ask for water from the cactus, but finally it did ask for help. The cactus kindly agreed. The birds filled their beaks with water and watered the rose's roots. The moral of the story is never judge anyone by their appearance. Hi, I hope you all enjoyed the story and I just want to give a quick thank you to everyone who was able to attend the family walk. It was really great seeing you all and so lovely to see our children playing together once again. Um, I'll try to plan another event in the near future. If anyone knows of any good walks in the Ottawa area that are children friendly, send me an email. Alright, bye. Wishing you a great day. Now is the time in our service when we honor personal joys and sorrows of our lives by placing a smooth pebble into a bowl of sparkling water. Over the ages, humankind has seen much spiritual symbolism in the ever-expanding ripples of the water and in the strength represented by the stones. Today we place a pebble for David's 103-year-old mother who passed away recently. We think of David and his family. A pebble to honor Linda's, excuse me, 99-year-old mother who recently passed away. Our thoughts are with Linda. A pebble for Michelle, whose elderly dog, Bear, needed to be put down. He had been with Michelle and her family for many years. Thinking of Michelle. A pebble in memory of Joan's brother, Philip Turner, who died suddenly. He had visited First You with Joan as recently as February. Our thoughts are with Joan and her family. 
a pebble for the good news in the handling of COVID-19, and a pebble for the concerns which remain as we deal with this worrisome situation. One last pebble in the water to remember the unspoken joys and concerns that remain in our hearts and our minds. And I would like to share with you a very short meditation. These words are from a wall hanging in my home. It is called Journey, and it goes like this. Journey beyond your wildest dreams. Take the first step on your journey. Believe in yourself. And then, take another step. Let us share in a moment of stillness. Today, we welcome as guest speaker, Leslie Kemp. Leslie is a member of the Unitarian Church of Vancouver and co-chairs its Social Justice Committee. She is a Canadian Unitarians for Social Justice board member, CUSJ, and editor of Just News. Leslie will talk to us about a world turned upside down and social justice in the time of COVID-19. How do we, as Unitarians, who promote justice, equity, and compassion, go forward into the future. We look forward to Leslie's words later in the service. I've been considering the phrase, all my relations, for some time now. It's hugely important. It's our saving grace in the end. It points to the truth that we are all related, that we are all connected, that we all belong to each other. The most important word is all, not just those who look like me, sing like me, dance like me, speak like me, pray like me, or behave like me. All my relations. That means every person, just as it means every rock, mineral, blade of grass, and creature. We live because everything else does. If we were to choose collectively to live that teaching, the energy of our change of consciousness would heal each of us and heal the planet. This is a reading from Richard Wakamese's book, Embers. Just over 21 years ago, I became a Unitarian joining the Unitarian Church of Vancouver. I was drawn to the principles, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and justice, equity, and compassion. A commitment to social justice is one of the reasons I continue to be a Unitarian. It's the way I live out my values. It's also why I'm a member and on the board of the Canadian Unitarians for Social Justice. I was asked to speak today after I wrote an article in Just News the CUSJ's news magazine. This article, Social Justice in the Time of COVID-19, reflected on the crisis that our world had entered. We were then just two months into the pandemic. Well, that seems like a long time ago now. There are things I wrote then that still ring true. The article was written in early May. It reflects on the multifaceted crisis of the pandemic, the ongoing climate crisis, and the impending economic depression. All of these realities are with us still. On top of this, we have seen social upheavals in the U.S. and around the world, sparked by outrage at George Floyd's brutal murder by police in Minneapolis. The cries to defund the police have echoed around the world. All over Canada, there were protests, rallies and marches from cities to small communities. PEI, a population of just 140,000, saw 10,000 people in the streets of Charlottetown. The New York Times and others have said 
that this movement around Black Lives Matter may be the largest movement in U.S. history. The George Floyd protests have brought an estimated 15 to 26 million people out in the streets. And the protests and strong reaction from the U.S. federal government to bring armed troops out so show no sign of stopping anytime soon. 2019 saw huge uprisings around the world. Millions were on the street day after day in Hong Kong for months starting last June, protesting the government's extradition bill and moves to take away democratic rights. China has now imposed a new national security law that removes basic, basic democratic freedoms. In Chile, Protests that started last October against inequality, social injustice, and the high cost of living culminated in one million Chilean women joining a massive protest on International Women's Day in March. And Lebanon has been convulsed with a series of protests starting last October triggered by taxes, corruption, and failures of government to provide basic services. The so-called October Revolution triggered the resignation of the Prime Minister. It's now been 279 days since the upheaval started, and Lebanon seems to be on the verge of a failed state. There are more examples of, of upheaval and protest in countries around the globe. When the COVID pandemic first hit, and lockdowns around the world came into force, there appeared to be a bit of a lull. But the pressures that gave rise to these upheavals have not gone away. And COVID, if anything, has only intensified the unrest. Here in Canada, things are much calmer, but there are signs of a mood against police violence and systemic racism as more and more cases have come to light of egregious police violence against Indigenous men and women, against Black people, and against people of colour. The demonstrations we've seen in the past few weeks and increased calls to defund the police show this mood. In January of 2020, social justice advocates were mobilizing in support of the Wet'suwet'en and their fight against the Coast GasLink pipeline. Unitarians were among them. Both CUSJ and the CUC sent out a statement of solidarity. In addition to Indigenous rights, many Canadians were sounding the alarm bell about the need for transformative change to tackle the climate crisis. The threat of the global pandemic swept aside these concerns, at least from the forefront of consciousness. Most of us were preoccupied about how to stay safe amid, amidst this glow, uh, growing pandemic, how to physically distance, how to be safe at work, how to work at home, how to gather in our familiar spaces, including church, in new ways, with many making the transition to Zoom and other online platforms. Now, several months into the crisis, into this new period, let's reflect on where we're at. Certainly, the health crisis provoked by COVID-19 is still with us and is likely to be for some time to come. However, we are still facing a climate catastrophe, the international Energy Agency has forecast that CO2 emissions could fall by 8% this year, but it noted that global emissions would need to fall by 7.6% every year this decade in order to limit warming to less than 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. We are now smack in the middle of an economic downturn not seen since the 1930s depression. In March, 1 million Canadians lost their jobs, and in April, a record 2 million lost jobs, bringing the total job loss to at least 3 million. While things have improved a little bit, we still have an, an, an official 
unemployment rate of 12.3%. But the real unemployment is likely much higher given that many Canadians work in precarious jobs, um, part-time jobs, small businesses are failing, and millions are at risk of being unable to pay their rents in one of the wealthiest nations on earth. This is in despite the unprecedented spending by governments at all levels, but in particular the federal government. Globally, the prospects for the world's poor are dire. Oxfam released a report in April calling for urgent action to prevent up to half a billion people falling into poverty and hunger as a result of the COVID crisis. In 2019, Oxfam shared some startling figures about growing wealth inequality worldwide. In just one year, the wealth of the world's billionaires increased by $900 billion, or $2.5 billion per day. Meanwhile, the wealth of the poorest half of humanity, 3.8 billion people, fell by 11%. Further, wealth is becoming more concentrated, with just 26 people owning the same as 3.8 billion people who make up the poorest half of humanity. The report also compared the wealth of the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos, owner of Amazon, to the whole health budget for Ethiopia, a country of 105 million people. They said just 1% of his fortune is equivalent to the whole health budget of Ethiopia. Canada is not immune to this growing inequality. The Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives reported in 2017 that Canada's highest paid CEO's compensation was an average, in, in 2015, was an average of $9.5 million, which was 193 times more than someone earning an average wage. These figures should pose deep questions about the sustainability of our society particularly the economic system, which many have reluctantly accepted as inevitable and perhaps unchangeable. Many of us have focused on pressing for reforms under capitalism, but in reality, we have seen the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. There is now greater inequality in our society than at any time in history. We also need to confront the reality that capitalism and its most virulent form, neoliberalism, has contributed to this crisis in a significant way. Scientists and doctors have warned of a pandemic for years and our governments, like almost every government in the world, chose to ignore this warning. Warning: We have been woefully unprepared despite the recommendations of the National Advisory Committee on SARS and Public Health in 2003. After China, Canada was the country worst hit by SARS with 44 people dying. The committee made hundreds of recommendations to help prevent the spread of future epidemics. It's clear that Canada has learned little from SARS. Months into this crisis, Canada is still trying to source supplies of protective equipment for health workers. Neoliberalism's ideology of getting government out of the way of making big profits for business has been the dominant ideology for 40 years. This trend saw corporations taking over areas of responsibility that were previously in the public or not-for-profit domain. One example is seniors care, which has been woefully neglected, with the most pronounced examples being for-profit care homes. Long-term care facilities account for 81% of all deaths in Canada from the coronavirus. 81%. Government Commission reports, seniors advocates and others have been calling for changes to seniors care for years specifically calling attention to inadequate care in, in, in for-profit homes. 
why are profits allowed to be made on the backs of vulnerable people like seniors? This, too, is part of the ne neoliberal ideology, which tries to find as many ways as possible for corporations to make a profit. The first serious challenge to neoliberalism came with the Occupy movement, which in turn grew out of the recession of 2008-09, which saw banks being bailed out while thousands of people lost their homes. This bailout of financial institutions at the expense of ordinary people happened throughout much of the world, including in Canada. Globalization was a key mantra of the neoliberal world, with companies shifting production to parts of the world where labor was cheap and liberalized trade rules favored corporate profits over environmental and workers' protection. While the COVID-19 crisis shows sign that neoliberalism is being further challenged with governments now having to step up to provide services that are not profitable for business, the brutal reality is that some corporations, like Amazon, are profiting heavily due to COVID-19. While there have been outbreaks at Amazon facilities across the U.S., deaths of workers, Amazon and its billionaire CEO Jeff Bezos have profited heavily. While 36 million Americans filed for unemployment in the first two months of the pandemic, U.S. billionaires saw an increase in wealth of $282 billion. While profits are going into the pockets of billionaires, Amazon has told warehouse employees that they will see their um, $2 an hour hero pay dropped. And in Canada, also the hero pay for many so-called essential retail workers has been eliminated. We need to confront the hard reality of who is paying for governments failing to protect the health of Canadians. Who is paying for this depression? Who is paying for the climate crisis? And who is benefiting? The truth is that most of us are paying. Some would call us the 99%, but whatever percentage is chosen, the reality is that most people in Canada are at some risk and specific groups face higher risks. If you are poor, homeless, a minimum wage worker, an immigrant or a temporary foreign worker, or health care or a senior in long-term care, or someone classified as an essential worker, you are vulnerable. And that includes a good percentage of us Canadians. On the other hand, those at the top of our economic pyramid, the CEOs, highly paid executives and bankers, have benefited for years from a system that has enriched them at the expense of many of us. Their wealth is at the expense of workers who have struggled with perpetually stagnant wages increased personal debt, and Canadians have among the highest personal debt in the world, and out-of-reach housing prices. Their wealth is at the expense of our natural environment, including endangered species, which although very resilient, is suffering from land and water pollution, increased CO2 levels, plastics in the environment, and more. And they have benefited at the expense of those who are most vulnerable, those who are at risk of violence caused by economic imperialism, colonialism, and political persecution. We must face the truth. The virus of capitalism has wreaked more havoc upon people and the planet than COVID-19 is ever likely to do. Many already live in a world that exposes them to risks many of us are fortunate enough not to face. Economic devastation, food insecurity, job loss, lack of clean drinking water, no money to pay for childcare, homelessness, violence in their homes, and more. 
As Unitarians, we need to focus attention on the fundamental issues giving rise to such death and destruction. We need to dig deeper to uncover the truth that COVID-19 has so brutally exposed. We are all connected. We are all connected. Recognizing this, we can birth a new world out of the ashes of the old. Let us live out our final, perhaps most important principle. Respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Thank you for joining us this morning at First Unitarian Congregation of Ottawa. This is the time in our service that we usually accept the offering. You may go to our website or contact our finance manager to find out how you might keep up with your pledge or make a donation during these very unusual times. We give these gifts freely. We receive these gifts gratefully. We dedicate these gifts to the work of the congregation, serving human wholeness, caring for the planet, upholding religious freedom, welcoming the stranger, loving one another. I'd like to share words from Richard Wagamese's Embers. You can't test your courage timidly. You have to run through the fire, arms waving, legs pumping, and heart beating wildly with the effort of reclaiming something vital, lost, laid aside, or just plain forgotten. When you do that, you discover that we shine most brightly in community. The whole bedraggled, worn, frayed, and tattered lot of us. Bound together forever by a shared courage. A family forged in the heart of earnest struggle.
Another favorite saying from a wall in my home. May our home know happiness, each room hold laughter, and every window open to possibilities. And now, go in peace, go in love, go in joy, and may all be well. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. You're not alone. You're not alone. Don't you give up. Don't you give up. Keep moving on. Keep moving on. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love.